Right, uh, my name's Rob Latchford. Uh, I'm from I'm from Gurley. Uh, the topic I'm choosing is uh, cover crops. Um, I first would like to thank my sponsor, uh, who is here today, John Eastburn, who um, who's been very good to me and actually has become a very good friend. And his right hand la lady, Georgie Alley. I guess I should thank. Um, uh, Mr. Brownhill, because he's the one that got me to do the nut field. Um, also, I'd like to thank my wife Penny and my ch three children, Chloe, Thomas, and Jeremy. Where is Gurley? Gurley is um, in the on the New Highway, northwest of New South Wales. It's uh, about 30k south of Moree, and this area is, about, is probably the most productive agriculture shire in Australia. We have a big area, especially irrigation, so a lot of cotton. Um, a lot of wheat and everything in between. The soil type is uh, self-mulching, cracking grey to black loams. Um, it can be can be very deep, um, uh, like the Darling Downs just out west of here. Um, the only restriction can be uh, is really is just water, um, black earth, fertile soil soils. The average rainfall is about 575 mils. But when I got back to my global focus group, um, we had uh, 600 mils in about three or four months, and it just it just took took our country. It took my crop. That's a cotton crop in that picture. Um, it's devastated a lot of country. Uh, I decided that I couldn't pay a contractor to fix it all, so I went and bought a laser bucket and tractor, and it's been flat out getting the dirt back out of the creek and putting it back where it belongs. My, this is my main crop. I'm a cotton grower. Um, I'm not as passionate as Adam, but I love what I do. I think cotton's pretty good. <laughs> it, uh, it's a very unique crop. It, uh, it, it's um, quite hard to get established, but once it's established, it's very hard to kill. The way um, I've been growing cotton for 20 years, and uh, back then we were it was conventional cotton, and a lot of work. We have to spray it 17 times through the season. Um, I have spend most of my time with a boom spray. And then since then, about the mid-90s, along came Monsanto with um, an Ingard, which uh, cut our sprays in half. Um, that, was a, that was a big bonus. That sort of gave the first half of the season break, and we didn't have to spray to probably start up to Christmas. And then um, a lot after that, they came along with a, a Roundup Ready. So that, that saved us some money too, because we, well, saved us some time. It, um, let us put Roundup over the crop. So this is a genetically modified crop now. Um, Terry? <laughs> it's not a monster. It's <laughs> anyway, then, then they moved on. Um, as they got more intellectual, they got, to, they got the um, cotton into a bowl guard, which gave us, in dry land, 100% protection from, from grubs. So it, got, it went from 17 sprays to none. So it was a, it, it, the take-up was huge. And then they came along with a, a, a Roundup Ready Flex. And that's pretty much what we got now. And that Flex allows us to spray right through the season. Now we know the issues with that is Roundup on Roundup on Roundup is going to bring issues with, with resistance. But we're, we're, we're watching it, we're very close eye. So, the, so from um, going from back then to making cotton so easy to grow has also, also affected the price. It's, it's made it easy to grow everywhere, everywhere around the world. So. You have the stack where the prices have dropped off significantly. Um, we plant in about uh, uh, now. I should be finished planting by tonight. <laughs> Wish I was there. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, probably, we try and plant about seven seeds to the meter, um, and uh, which is just under four kilos a hectare. Now my my planting system is. Uh, I started off in 1990, we planted solid cotton, which is a, a one metre spacing. And uh, as the uh, P and D sheets got a bit tougher, which is uh, the quality control, we had to start widening our rows to keep the quality up to, so we didn't get the dockages when we delivered the cottons. Um, so then we went to single skip, and that gave us a bit more moisture in the season. And that's a single skip is, is taking one row out and leaving two in. Um, so and then we found that we're still getting docky. So now we've moved to a double skip. So this that's a means that's a 50 percent of the paddock gets planted. So we've got two rows planted, missed two rows, and two rows planted. That seems to be work the best. We seem to keep the top grades, the good length, 
and the good quality and the dock is still minimum. And also at the Monsanto in were charging on a green hectare rate for the for the use of their technology. And that that allowed us to, us to compete with the irrigators, so we were basically paying half the amount they were paying for the for per hectare for the contract. They've since evolved um, through a lot of um, arguing from us drylanders uh, to, to an endpoint royalty, which allows me to just uh, pay them a, a $50 a bale price at, uh, when I deliver the cotton. This takes a lot of risk out um, due to the yield because we're subject to rain and um, it, uh, lets, it lets us uh, sleep at night. My, my rotation is, is, was, is down our way is pretty much uh, cotton, uh, long fallow um, into wheat, and then maybe back to cotton again, depending on the price. But I found the wheat wasn't making me much money, so I, I moved to a, a millet, which is just basically a cover, the cover crop. And this, um, this crop was uh, saving me through the summer, um, through the storms, and all, all the other hazards I had with loss of moisture. This is what happens when, when you finish picking. It's quite an intense operation. Um, this takes three passes, from slashing to uh, root cutting, um, and then a, a full pupae bus, which is, um, uh, is, is in the contract you have with Monsanto. You have to do a four inch uh, disturbance, which um, in case there is any grubs that make it through their, their gene technology and pupate into the ground, dig in the ground, we have to bring them back up to the surface so that they are destroyed by insects and other animals. So you can see what you can see my dilemma. I have to I needed something. So so the, the cover crop was to protect from rain and wind erosion. Moisture it gave me moisture management, weed management with the competition, and gave my soil some nutrition and health with the keeping the bugs alive. So being a typical nut builder, I thought I needed something better. You've got to always be changing. So I decided I needed something that maybe would, that had to be fast growing because it was a short season. We need to get this uh, cover crop up, doing its job, and then desiccate it so that then we can start the moisture building process from the natural weather events. It had, then I thought maybe I need something more than just a stubble mulch. Maybe a legume would be just would be ideal, and it would provide nitrogen. And, and we needed legume that didn't took too much moisture out, and we need something that increased nutrition, enhanced yields from the next crop. A silver bullet, that's what I was looking for. So off we went. First place we stopped was Brazil. This is my wife sitting in front of the Igazul Falls in Brazil. We went to three different areas, and we were looking to see if the Brazil had the Holy Grail of covers. At the Ponta Grossa area, we found that they were already um, doing using cereal ryegrass as a cover. Um, they were using black oats, which I took a long time to get my head around. I spent most of my life trying to get rid of them. <laughs> and they also had a, a Brazilian hairy vex, which looked quite promising. They were using a rotation with their wheat crops, so they, um, this Ponte Grossa area is, is in the south, so they didn't have a summer crop option. Um, they also had a co-op set up, which uh, did research for them, was funded by the farmers and did research into um, um, cover crops and any other issues that the farmers had. It looked a, good, a really good system. Then we went to the Matagosso. It was um, opened up 25 to 30 years ago. It had large holdings by corporates and co. It had, um, and they plant cotton in January, pick in August, and it's, it's a hot, dry uh, system where the it's a bit like the northern hemisphere here with Darwin, where you get you get all your rain in, in the November, March, um, in a metre and a half of rain. So there's a lot of water coming through this. There was a company there, Adriana Seeds, who produced soybeans and on also some um, millet that um, that helped them with their cover crops. I saw an interesting picture. This you see that there that is continuous contour field. I hadn't seen it before. And it made me realise that, that when the summer comes, the rain must really come from the contour continually all the way down the field. This is a 7,000 7, hectare field ready for a cover crop from Melito, planted by air. We then went to the western Bahia. It was a new agricultural frontier. 
You've probably heard this is where they're knocking all the rainforest down to, to, to farm it up. It was 30% of Brazilian cotton production and 5% soybeans and 3% corn. <coughs> this back, Braca Rio Bresanthia is a, um, a South African um, grass, which they use pr predominantly there in this area. It's a, it's a, it seems to be a quick growing, fast grass that, um, that will hold their sandia soils together, and they were using it in rotation with uh, corn and cotton. Then on my fo global focus group, we happened to be in the south of France, and um, this is Sarah Singh. She's a fellow nut filler, and she she was very uh, obliging and helped showed us around her place and, and around the district as well. She um, she was using. They have a restriction in France on the amount of fertilizer they can apply to their soil, so she was trying to enhance that fertilizer with with cover crops by using one of them was a radish which um, absorbed nitrogen and then would slowly release it again when the crop was growing. And she also used the buckwheat, which is another weed I've been trying to get rid of for 20 years, so to mineralise the, the, the phosphorus in the soil. Then I started to think maybe the silver bullet doesn't exist. Maybe we need, I, I need more than one thing to do just to um, put in my cover. A cocktail. <laughs> I then, we then went to the Estates and um, over there, they were using everything they could in the cocktail. They were, they were um, using any broadleaf and, and grass they could. They would mix it all in and just sow it to as a cover crop. The advantage they had was that their winters are so cold and, and severe that the, the over the over summer wintering period they would desiccate everything. So they they didn't have the problem that we may have in, in trying to get rid of some of these <coughs> crops. So is diversity the key to the cover cropping? Then the light bulb hit me. I, where to go from here with cover cropping? I was going to attempt the, the concept of cocktail covers, um, depending on what species I could get, um, and the seed stock availability. It seemed to be the restriction I, I found when I got back here. Um, the influence that these may have on the following cash crop whether cotton being very susceptible to hormones, um, whether I can make sure these things weren't growing with the cotton. Um, the economics of, 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 of doing this and blending these, these crops and the trialling of different mixes. Did my focus change? Um, would I do anything different? I've already started. Um, we're, at home I've, I've got some trials with some vetch mixed with millet, um, vetch on its own, and I'm, I'm getting some guar, which is a an Indian uh, growing uh, legume, and we're trying that next month. We're going to see if it's the moisture seeks. My other topic I was, I was just uh, dabbling with was uh, the resistance, which that's going to hit, and it's going to hit us in some form. We don't know yet, but um, in, the, in the middle of uh, America, Waynesboro, Georgia, they had this, this Palmer amaranth, and which we call, they call pigweed. And it's a quite an aggressive plant that uh, grew very fast, re reproduced very quick, and up to half a million seeds per plant. And it was completely round up resistant. Um, their, their form of, of getting rid of this was either uh, hand, hand chipping or, or wicking over the, the growing crop that was in there. This um, definitely rang alarm bells. And uh, we already knew that five second-hand pickers have, have been delivered to Australia back in 2011. And there were dozens more coming beginning this year. I know there's, there's a lot more coming next year. Um, we, we already decided we should contact the authorities and, and if they did not already know that grain growers and Cotton Australia alert farmers and contractors. The second-hand cotton pickers imported from glyphosate resistant areas may pose a risk to Aussie farms. Include the Palmer Amaranth photo in the wheat literature so farmers knew what to, to look out for. My other interest, it's a bit of a hobby, um, is uh, modifying farm machinery. Um, it's nothing better than looking at the back of some, some farmer's shed and see what they've mucked around with. Um, we saw a few different things. Um, getting the stubble 
of cotton to get rid of is a massive problem and, and very expensive. And we're trying to, I'm trying to build a machine that will do it in one or two passes. And we saw there's some um, some heavy duty rollers that were trying to chop it up in the field. Um, and the that was in the states. This one here is in um, in Brazil with the root cutters, but that's actually I think is an Australian invention, um, which it's more suited to irrigation than dry land having the hills. And also in Brazil they were using um, this to uh, just remove the cotton and, and semi sort of chop it up. Around the world uh, we saw. On the global focus, we came across a combine piggybacking a John Deere tractor. And I was quite, quite amazed by this. You can see the, job, the tractor is used for the power plant of the combine. Um, the Indians have got, taken the wheels off and shoved it up there. And you can see the drive shaft coming down to the front, to the front of the combine. That would drive the, um, the motion and obviously the operation of the combine. And once they finished harvesting, they would just simply pull it off and put the wheels back on it and continue on using it. <laughs> Only in India. Um, in Brazil, they had uh, uh, a stripper, which is um, a little bit different to a cotton picker, but, but it looked very good, very well made, and, and looked like it would compete with the with the uh, Americans' market very well. Um, the John Deere's that were the only ones that made this machine. In um, in Washington State, we uh, we came across the Palouse, this beautiful soil. That, and the only thing wrong was it was undulating, very undulating. And it was so steep, these tractors would slip down the side of the hills. So they had jewels on them. And not only that, the, the operators would be stuck against one, one glass mm. with the window. So they, they designed it so they could tilt them, so that the operator could sit in the middle of, middle of the seat. And I was quite amazed by that. In, in Turkey, we, I can't cross it, it's it just a European disc that um, they were using to, to dispose of their cotton stubble. Back home, I muck around with a bit of machinery. That, that's a that's a plan that should be finished tonight. Um, it's uh, 36 metres wide, and it is planting 18 rows on that 36 metres in a double skip formation. I uh, I also designed it so I could use the technology from John Deere boom sprays, which have a swap control. This. Uh, allows me not to, a swap control um, allows the boom spray not to over spray automatically. As soon as you cross the headlands it, it will turn the sections off. So I adapted that to my planter. So it lifts my pairs of uh, planter rows up and the drive wheel for each pair is, is connected in the middle. And um, this, uh, this does a very good job and doesn't over plant which becomes issue with, with moisture with, when, in the growing season. I also uh, mucked around with a brand new cotton picker. I was a bit famous for cutting up an $800,000 machine with an oxy. <laughs> this, is a, this is a six row machine that comes, uh, comes out standard at, at one metre spacings. So we modified it to suit our row spacings. We, we moved each pair uh, sideways two metres uh, so we could stay on our tram tracks. Um, but also the wheels were modified to get on the three metre centres as well. And, uh, and which the rear wheels were quite hard because they're actually driven. So we had to, uh, there's a company here in Toowoomba that made us up a, um, uh, some drive shafts and discs to, to do this. Also on the back, there's a, a trailer which is actually made down the road here as well. We got it um, specially made and so we can carry the round bales of cotton out of the field because there's nothing worse than trucks coming in to get the modules. We're trying to keep everything off the field. Um, and it's, uh, we're having issues with it. We just, we're having trouble getting from the picker to the trailer. So I'm going to redesign it this year. Um, so the trailer drops down as the, as the bale tips onto it. This is my current project. That's uh, a new winter crop planter sitting there. Um, <laughs> it's ready to go. I've already purchased the, the, um, the tractor for it. I, I decided I need uh, at least 550 horsepower to pull this planter that I'm going to build. So that's a track machine that's going to do that job. I've also uh, uh, bought an air sealer 20,000 cubic metres of, of um, capacity to put behind it. Um, the designs are <coughs> in, my, in my head right now and I reckon well by this time next year she should be operational. I'd like to thank uh, 
my fellow nut builders. They had a really good time. We had, there was um, never a time where you wish you weren't there, except for India. <laughs> um, I'd just like to say, um, this is the challenges, me personally, in our area, we're going to have a head, and I know out west of here, all the way up, there, there's coal seam gas is going to be our biggest issue, more than anything else I do or on my farm. And um, my wife's quite passionate about this, and I just leave you with this thought that, um, you know, I know there's a, some people in this room that may argue with me, but um, I think that the, um, the downside is so much bigger than, than what the little bit of money they're going to get out of this gas. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, throw it open to questions. Uh, before I do, I'd just like to uh, ask him uh, about that threat of the, the pigweed and your thoughts on, uh, on exactly the quarantine on that used machinery coming in and the standard of it. Um, I actually was at the, um, at the wharf. We were picking up a container of parts and um, we saw all these machines and they, <clears throat> they are pretty thorough to clean these things down, but you know, it's always a percentage. There's always a chance it's going to come through and, and I, don't, I don't have much faith that we'll stop it, but I'm hoping we can. If, it, if it's not that weird, it's going to be something else. I mean, flea bones, it's, it's, a, it's an issue for us. Uh, but we're learning how to deal with it. Um, once, um, if we ever lose Roundup, like Roundup and, and GPS are probably the two greatest things that in Broadacre farming that ever, ever came with, come with us. And so, yeah, let's, let's hope we can, we can deal with it. Stan, sure, as a Brockwing up your scholar, did you ever encounter a, a crop they call sun hemp in southern Africa? It's a critter, it's area as a cover crop. We used to use it a lot. Yeah, I did. I, the, the issue I had with that was the moisture it needed to grow that crop. I thought it would take so much of my subsoil moisture to produce the cover crop that I wouldn't get the replenishment to, to feed my cotton crop. That was, that was the only reason I had. Otherwise, it was a good, long-lasting cover crop. Yeah, definitely. You can fast grind. Yeah. Uh, question over there. Uh, David Shannon. Um, just wondering about uh, your, your, I suppose, what, what you speculate on, how you'll be able to cope in the future without Roundup, because obviously the system you've got at the moment is fantastic, and you're getting everything you need through that uh, GM package, but it does rely very heavily on Roundup for weed control. Do you think the cover crop will give you that uh, weed control of the future, or how, how are you going to deal with a situation where you don't have Roundup as a weed control? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we, um, there's a couple of other companies. Bayer's made uh, uh, Liberty Link, which is a, another cotton variety which has <coughs> uses a different chemical in the, in the crop. Maybe we can slip across to that for a season or two to get rid of any issues we have. Um, that, that, they don't have any Bulgar um, properties yet, so the Roundup, yeah, and I, I would imagine Monsanto is working on it. They will have something that's very expensive and works very well that will, will solve anything we have. But, but you're right, I think, I think awareness is probably the best way, just to keep an eye on I mean, there's, there's, when we heard of the ryegrass problem in West Australia, I, we, I started to look around and, and I realised I actually had some ryegrass resistant um, in my paddocks and so I, I changed my rotate, I, we moved to a different chemical um, but I'm not going to rely on that, if, if, it, if it comes, if it really comes, the last resort is, is the plough and if, if you have to do that for a season, we'll say be it, I, but we, we can't have these resistant, we can't have these weeds in our fields. Um, Rob, I was just wondering, uh, you've obviously been doing this for a while, uh, just uh, what the extent of cover cropping use is in, in cotton growing generally um, uh, in the industry and what you're going to do about uh, uh, extending your knowledge. And the second question is, uh, when are you going to stick your 500 horsepower John Deere on top of your cotton picker? <laughs> All that warranty though? <laughs> My John Deere cotton picker has 600 horsepower in it already. <laughs> Um, 
Oh, what's the extent of cover, cover cropping in the cotton oh, industry? Not very much at all, and I can't claim it's my idea. Is is actually a man out here, Jamie Grant, is just out here near Dalby. He's he was a real pusher for it. And he's um, but down my area, I would be the only cotton grower I know that's that's doing this rotation. Um, I've started to have second thoughts. Cotton. I didn't talk about pricing. Uh, you can probably wait how much money I make in a minute, um, <laughs> or don't make. Um, cotton has gone the last, uh, uh, this time last year, I think was this time last year, cotton was a thousand dollars a bale, and that was huge. But now cotton is sitting at about three eighty, and and hence I'm probably the only drying cotton grower in New South Wales at the moment. I don't. Um, let's Dave Brown has put some in. Yeah, yeah we're in too, Rob. So I uh, there's another one. On. Yeah. Doesn't sound like the nut bill. Um, but we hope, you know, there might be a spike in the price or something, but that's what I do, and, and I, I enjoy cotton. Cotton's, cotton, when you compare cotton to wheat or anything else, there's been so much um, uh, movement in cotton. We've moved so far. Like, we, I know you don't like genetically modified crops, but we're, it's a big successful sort of story in, in, in cotton. The only downside is that we, you know, we've got this uh, a mono, uh, one person doing it. We need another company to do it to, to get, get the price down a little. Okay, well thanks Robert um, uh, for an informative talk. I, I think you can see the passion that he displays.